Today on The Grave Talks, Rosemary Ellen Guiley. From a very young age, Rosemary Ellen Guiley has had run-ins with the paranormal. Learning of the psychic connection her family had to the other side, Rosemary's lifelong interest in something else was sparked. She would go on to write more than 50 books on a wide range of paranormal, spiritual, and mystical topics, oftentimes connecting the worlds of ghosts, Bigfoots, and UFOs into the same realm. Rosemary is an active researcher on many topics involving the paranormal. Today, we discuss areas such as the Angela Webb property, hauntings in Greene County, Pennsylvania, dreams and their connections with the dead, and much more. Tony, this has been a lifelong path for me. Ever since I was a kid, I've been fascinated by the unseen, by UFOs, by the paranormal, the supernatural. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of kids are and a lot of kids have experiences. But for, for me, my interests really stuck. And part of that had to do with the fact that uh, I grew up in a family with some psychic experiences uh, in the mix there, uh, my family members. And uh, I just found these topics riveting. I was interested in astronomy when I was young, and that kind of puts your mind out there in terms of contemplating big cosmic perspectives and and pictures. And so eventually, as time went on, uh, and I got into my writing career, it uh, turned out that I could turn my personal interest into my professional pursuit. And this was after some years of working as a journalist and an editor in various capacities. Uh, I wanted to be an author, and uh, I originally intended to write fiction, but I knew a lot of editors in the publishing field, and um, I was asked to write nonfiction on some of these topics uh, because there was such an interest in them. And so I launched into a nonfiction career and uh, never really went back to fiction. I've still done a little fiction on the side every now and then, but I have close to 70 books to my credit now. And it's a never-ending search. I love what I do. I've been working full-time in the field now since 1983. And um, it spans quite a range of activities because I think they're all interconnected. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm very involved in the paranormal, paranormal investigation, mysterious creatures, paranormal phenomena, psychic uh, sorts of experiences. Uh, But I'm also involved in ufology. Uh, That's an important component. Uh, And certainly major cryptid research like Bigfoot. And then I'm also very involved in metaphysical topics like afterlife studies, near-death experiences, uh, contact with uh, alien beings, um, and not just extraterrestrials, but alien beings of all kinds. Uh, My emphasis has always been on how we have our experiences and how we're transformed by them, for better or worse. Are they negative or positive experiences? And I've never really felt a need to prove these things. My work isn't about collecting evidence, trying to prove to a doubting or skeptical audience that such things exist. Rather, my audience has had experiences and uh, they're looking for more information to put them into a meaningful context so that they can benefit from them. That's really the thrust of my work. Sure, and I completely understand. That's how our our programs are. We're never here to prove that this exists or doesn't exist. Our audience, they're already there. They know it's there. They're looking for some some answers or some some exactly an understanding of of where this all fits into their life. Uh, You had mentioned earlier some psychic experiences in your family as a child. Can you touch on that a little bit for us? What were some of those first experiences that made you go as a child and say, hmm, this seems a little different than what Jimmy down the road is has going on in his family? (laughs) Well, you know, when you're a little kid and you have experiences, you sort of assume that everybody has those experiences. And as I got older, then I realized that not everybody does. And not only is that the case, but the outside world is very judgmental about these things, uh, with many people not believing in them whatsoever. 
And uh, as I got older, even into my teens, that certainly puzzled me. Well, as a, as a kid, I was not a psychic wonder kind by any means. Um, I really didn't see or encounter um, much in the way of the dead until I was much older uh, into adulthood. But um, kids often have invisible playmates. I certainly had those. I believe a lot of those uh, belong to the fairy realm. I had a lot of experiences with angels, and I uh, believed angels to be around me at all times. Um, now, one of the uh, important influences in my life uh, had to do with precognitive dreaming, and they weren't my dreams uh, per se, but they were my mother's dreams. My mom had a lot of uh, psychic experiences of all kinds, and she had um, precognitive dreams that came th true in some way. And uh, as is the case with a lot of precognitive dreamers, uh, many of these dreams involved uh, bad things happening to people, for example, accidents or people dying. And so, of course, they were very distressing to my mom. Uh, and it wasn't the case where she dreamed that person A was going to uh, die at a certain time in a certain way on a certain date. Uh, there were always elements that were incomplete in the dreams. And so uh, sometimes she knew something was going to happen, but depending upon the dream, um, it was unclear exactly when or specifically to whom or um, perhaps a date. Uh, usually something would happen within a two-week time period. Uh, while I was in my adolescent uh, years when my mom shared these dreams with me and I was absolutely riveted by the idea that dreams could predict the future in any kind of accurate way. And it launched me on a lifelong study of dreams. And uh, dreams remain very important to me uh, even today. By the time I was uh, in high school, I was experimenting a lot with my dreams uh, to, uh, to try and see the future, to send and receive messages with people, to travel out of body in dreams and visit distant locations and be able to uh, describe those locations in an accurate way. And I had enough success with that to convince me that dreams were absolutely an amazing medium of consciousness. Uh, and as I mentioned, it launched me on a lifelong study of dreams. Mm -hmm. I believe that dreams are an important bridge world to the astral realm and that they can open many doorways to us for extraordinary experiences of all kinds that um, might be more limited or even um, not even possible in waking consciousness. So our dreaming side is very important to our spiritual exploration, our overall well-being, and our capability of experiencing other realities and, and states of, of uh, consciousness. Primarily, our dreams are really about us and about how we think we're doing in the world, which is important enough. Sure. But there are these other aspects of dreams as well that take us into uh, more uncharted territories of consciousness. So those were some of the early experiences that uh, shaped uh, a lot of my emerging outlook on alternate realities. Uh, by the time I was 15, I was convinced of reincarnation. Uh, it was the only explanation that made sense to me for anything, even though I was, um, I was raised um, a Methodist, very, not super conservative, but pretty traditional. Uh, and I, ha I still believe in reincarnation. Um, and uh, I was um, a very active amateur astronomer for um, many years. And as I mentioned earlier, that kind of puts your mind out there uh, in terms of contemplating big picture questions. Uh, early on in, in my personal exploration, it was obvious to me that everything was interconnected, um, no matter where you started, whether it was with a Bigfoot sighting or a UFO or a ghost. Sooner or later, the dots would be connected to everything else. And that also has been an orientation that has uh, driven my own research and work. I'm pleased to see more researchers now abandoning their tunnel vision uh, and embracing that outlook as well. Mm -hmm. 
with things being more connected. Let's talk about uh, dreams just for a moment, because that's that's something that we hear about quite often. Um, and, and people assuming uh, sometimes, and sometimes with, with great evidence that comes beyond just the dream of a connection, uh, of oftentimes a visit from a deceased loved one uh, coming to them either to deliver a compelling message of some sort of sometimes information that there's no way they would have known otherwise. Sometimes it's almost like a sighting. They're just in their dream and, oh my God, so there's dad sitting over in his chair, but there's no message given. It seems very benign, but very comforting sometimes after someone has passed. With dreams and, and with individuals having those experiences, is it always a connection where as, as if that person who is deceased is coming back to, to give a message? Is it ever them coming back to give a message? Um, or is it sometimes just kind of our coping method, mechanisms uh, working within us to, to try and, and get through a loss or a tragedy? What, what's your, your thoughts on that through your research? Uh, well, in, in terms of the scope of all of those things, they're all certainly possible and they get mixed together in very complex dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, however, we can't dismiss dream visits from the dead as just simply wish fulfillment as part of the grieving process. They are much more than that. And uh, over the course of my research in into dreams, I started uh, encountering a lot of uh, testimonies from people about their dream visits from the dead and how convinced they were that they had actual visits, that these were not imaginary sorts of things. I should say fantasy sort of things because imagination is the the underlying uh, ability in human beings that enables us to have these experiences. And uh, that led over time to a book called Dream Visits, um, uh, Dream Messages from the Afterlife Visits from the Dead. Uh, and I do believe that the dead come back. Uh, they are purpose-driven because these visits uh, are very short. Uh, the dead have sometimes explained that the dynamics of enabling this bridge between the afterlife and the world of the living to form at all is very complex and tenuous and doesn't last very long. And so they're not aimless visits like a hi, how are you? Uh, even if there's no um, specific message conveyed, the mere presence is a message in and of itself. And uh, this is also a very uneven playing field. Uh, dream visits from the dead are not democratic by any means, and not everybody who wants one is going to get one. And that can create a lot of distress in people if they're desperate for some sort of reconnection with someone who's passed on. Uh, they begin to think that there's something wrong with them, uh, something bad has happened to the person on the other side, uh, they've become undeserving of a dream visit, they're being punished in some way, uh, and that's simply not the case. It, it has to do with mechanisms of consciousness and energy and vibrations, uh, of which we have very little, if any, understanding. Um, nonetheless, I think there are things we can do to fertilize our consciousness to make these sorts of experiences um, more inviting or perhaps even more likely to happen. So dream visits do have specific purposes and quite often urgent messages. They're very short to the point. Uh, sometimes they need interpretation just like uh, a regular dream. Uh, and they can have an extremely powerful impact upon the living. What do you make of, of the dream visit? And this is one that we don't hear of very often, but it, it does exist out there. Quite often we hear of the loved one, of the reconnection type dream, where it, it is wanted. It, it is something where they want to have either some reconciliation or just an answer that, that they're on the other side. But what about the dream visits? that people have from someone who's passed on. Maybe it is a parent, maybe it's a sibling, maybe it's just a friend or, or someone who was not such a, in, in good terms with the individual. It was a negative person, which certainly could be a parent or, or what would be considered uh, a sibling, not maybe necessarily love, but someone there who has a connection, who shows up in the dream uh, to almost further torment uh, the living individual in death uh, in a way that they had in life. Uh, where they, they come back with that same negativity and that same power that they had over the, the living when they were, you know, on the same plane together. 
Well, without benefit of knowing specific details of such experiences, it's it's hard for me to comment on that kind of dream as a blanket in sure. a blanket sort of way. Uh, the reason being is that the dead can return to us in dreams as symbols, okay. uh, not necessarily as actual visits, and that's quite common as well. That they become symbols of something, and and uh, everything in dreams are aspects of ourselves. Uh, so if someone had a, a, a bad relationship with someone, there were guilt issues, for example, or unresolved uh, anger, betrayal, whatever. Um, post mortem, somebody can come back, can uh, surface in a dream as a symbol of those unresolved issues. Mm -hmm. So, without knowing a specific dream and the characteristics of it, um, I, I can't make a pronouncement on those kinds of dreams in general. Um, dream visits from the dead do have distinct characteristics that are different from ordinary dreaming. And um, these dreams have a different environmental feel to them. Uh, sometimes people are uncertain whether or not they're dreaming or awake. Um, they may have heightened senses like colors are more vivid. Um, communication is telepathic. There's a surreal reality to them that is absent from ordinary dreaming. So it's an inexact science how to evaluate these things and sometimes it has to do with the emotional impact upon the dreamer. But there are criteria that you can apply to a dream to uh, you know to help evaluate in that regard. Uh, some of the dream experiences I have in my book where people had troubled relationships with someone who then made return visits, they're usually from the perspective of peacemaking and forgiving. And so I'm just inclined off the top of my head from, from the nature of your question, Tony, that if a dream uh, a dead person is returned in a dream to torment somebody, I'm more likely to take an ordinary dream psychological approach to it first to see if that can answer the situation before jumping to a more paranormal explanation, which would be um, a an actual dream visit. Yeah, where it's not always the spirit of the individual coming back. Sometimes it's just our mind trying to work through whatever uh, the the issue was with that individual maybe it's just replaying itself trying to find resolution let's uh, talk about uh, green county pennsylvania that was initially one of the uh, the reasons why i had reached out to you and obviously i know your work is far more vast than just the one uh, book uh, the the most haunted county in america but i'd like to touch on that for just a moment um the title itself very intriguing the most haunted county in america Quite uh, quite a statement to make, obviously, with with all of the the counties in America and all the hauntings that that are out there. Um, what what is it about Greene County and, and what what drew you to that? Uh, well, uh, first of all, the most haunted county in America is a description of the book, not really the title. Okay. Uh, the title is Haunted Hills and Hollows, What Lurks in Greene County, Pennsylvania. And uh, we've, uh, my co-author, Kevin Paul, and I have been asked, well, you know, what, what makes you say this is the most haunted county? Uh, well, it's a subjective evaluation, of course, and uh, it's based upon... Uh, a number of factors, including a lot of intense research over a very small geographic area uh, of a mother load of uh, undiscovered, unwritten about, really largely untalked about things that have gone on there for a long period of time. So mile for square mile, there's an intense amount of activity going on in Greene County. Um, now, I've known my co-author, Kevin Paul, for um, about nine years or so, and our relationship started uh, when he heard me on Coast to Coast one night uh, and sent me an email saying, you ought to come down down here to Greene County because we got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, well, I've got a lot of emails like that over the years, and I wish I could run off and answer them all. Um, but there was something about uh, how he described what was going on there that really intrigued me. And so I got on the phone and I thought, you know, this really bears uh, a look. Uh, and I thought, well, I'll make a few trips down there, see what's going on. 
and uh, one thing led to another and there was just no end to things uh, and largely unexplored territory. It was like going into a jungle that had never been explored by for, before, even though this county butts up against West Virginia, uh, which has been uh, written about quite a bit. It butts up against two of the most active Bigfoot counties in Pennsylvania. No one ever bothered uh, to go down into Greene County, the far southwest corner of the state. Um, UFO activity that was unexplored, um, and the list just went on and on and on. So uh, we started doing a lot of research and uh, collected enough material for a book. It took us years, really, uh, and a lot of that had to do with um, my availability to uh, go down to Greene County from Connecticut. Um, I travel a lot. Uh, my co-author, Kevin Paul, is a lifelong native of the area. His family goes back generations there. And he did possess uh, and does possess a wealth of knowledge of the background of things, you know, fam family histories, uh, local history, um, very good at, at uh, sort of putting a context and a backdrop on, on everything. But um, the upshot of it was that uh, it took us a good number of years to compile uh, what we felt was really the tip of the iceberg, and we are at work on a, on a second book. Um, understandably, because this is a very insular uh, area, that a lot of people were willing to talk about their experiences, but not with their names, because they, um, you know, many people don't want to be ridiculed by their friends and neighbors, or uh, they just don't want people knowing their business per se. And so we did give pseudonyms to a lot of people. Well, the book, now that it's uh, been out and it's a, a, has been a bestseller, uh, it hit number one and number two on Amazon in several categories. Uh, and uh, more people have come forward with their stories as well. So uh, I think book number two is going to go even deeper into the territory of, of Greene County. Um, so those are some of the things that inspired us to call it the most haunted county in America. Um, undiscovered territory, a rich mother load, uh, and active from A to Z. You know, just all kinds of phenomena going on there um, all the time. And um, largely unexplored. Uh, and now we've put it on the map. What would you say is one of the most compelling stories that, that came out of that county? Uh, well, one of my favorites, uh, which is the, the one that we use to open the book, and it's an attempted abduction by what we call a lobster thing. Uh, and it, it happened to... Um, a woman who at the time she was a teenager, her family had lived in the Hollers for generations in a remote area. Um, we described the terrain, there were shadow people, um, night howlers that could have been uh, Bigfoot. Uh, there seemed to be a mysterious time-space veil on the property where if you walked around certain areas you experienced missing time. A lot of UFO activity overhead, ghosts in the house. Uh, and this is what she grew up with. And when she was about 14, uh, she had an experience. Uh, we gave her the name Sherry uh, in the book as a pseudonym. Uh, and in fact, she still lives in, in her family home today uh, that her parents had once had. And uh, she'd had a lot of experiences uh, as a kid. But at 14, she woke up one night and the bedroom, she was up on the second floor her bedroom window had uh, an odd appearance to it. It was uh, illuminated with an intense bright light, which is often associated with UFO activity. An intense bright light, and it didn't seem to have glass in it anymore. It just seemed to be an open hole, this light coming through. And in, in the window was this huge creature that looked like a giant lobster. Uh, and uh, it had a giant claw, and it reached in and grabbed her by the arm and pulled her off the bed and toward the window like it wanted to take her out the window. Uh, and she started struggling mightily against it. Uh, and 
to the point where it dropped her and uh, she passed out and the next thing she knew she was awake in the morning uh, still lying on the floor uh, where the creature had dropped her the window is back to normal uh, but there is a huge bruise on her arm, and her arm is very sore where the creature had clamped onto her. And so she was very terrified by this experience. And was it a dream or was it a real experience? And if it wasn't a dream, how did she get this bruise? Well, she decided not to tell her parents. Even though she had told them about a lot of her experiences, she thought this one was just too over the top. And so she... Uh, kept quiet about it for many, many years. So the, now this was the first time I'd ever heard of, uh, I, you know, the, I've, I've heard of all kinds of abducting creatures. The greys are the most famous, of course. Um, but I've never heard of a, a lobster thing uh, that reaches in a window with a claw and tries to grab someone. So what are we dealing with here? Uh, well, it's, it's my opinion that a lot of these being shapeshift, to some sort of form that suits their purpose. And it may be that they take a form that could be especially that they know getting into the head of someone, and I do believe they have the telepathic ability to do that, uh, would be especially terrifying to the individual or might make them feel particularly helpless or paralyzed. And so whatever it was that was trying to abduct Sherry uh, may have taken this form um, as as a way of uh, trying to overcome her and uh, they might uh, this entity might not have banked on her being so ferocious in her her fight back uh, we don't have lobster things documented in the ET contact literature uh, we've got lots of other kinds of beings. Uh, you know, they, they really run the gamut of a fairy encyclopedia in terms of their appearances and behavior and uh, sizes and, and whatnot. But lobster things, this is, uh, this is a unique form. And uh, so that's one of the reasons why we chose to open the book with it, because it was so unusual. Yeah. Very unusual. And I know you, you were you're talking earlier about there's being a connection between all of these things, whether it be, you know, the Bigfoots, UFOs, uh, paranormal activity, um, and, and a connection amongst all these, not just that they're all in their own category. Could you expound upon that a little bit further as far as, you know, I know it's, it can go into that for hours, I'm sure, but give us kind of the brief synopsis of, of how you believe these things can all be connected. Well, in, this, in a couple of different ways, uh, Tony, and one is uh, just l looking at the concurrent events in a particular area. You know, there are a lot of hot spots areas where there seems to be something unusual going on either almost all the time or frequently. And we have waves of activity, waves of UFO activity, waves of creature sightings and things like that that occur in certain areas. And <clears throat> when you look at just the phenomena uh, seldom is it one thing and one thing only. If, if there's one thing going on, there's usually something else going on along with it. And uh, researchers have documented over time, this is something that's not been adequately uh, researched by either the Bigfoot side or the UFO side, but there is a concurrence of Bigfoot sightings and UFO activity. For example, if there's a wave of UFO activity, uh, if you look at other reports of things that people are experiencing, you will all find concurrent with that uh, a wave of Bigfoot sightings and sometimes other mysterious cryptids as well. Uh, in areas that are hot spots that seem to be um, ongoing uh, beds of act activity, uh, there will be, uh, uh, it's, it's not unusual to find that. Um, places are haunted, that a lot of the homes in the area uh, are haunted, that there are things, unknown things, drifting around the landscape, that uh, people have uh, missing time, or they see shadow people, or um, other unusual beings, maybe like black-eyed people. There will be UFO activity overhead. So 
um, these things need to be examined together and not separately. But it's been the tendency of researchers for a long time to focus on one particular thing, just to look at the UFO activity or just to look at uh, cryptid sightings. Uh, probably the Mothman wave of 1966 to 67 is a textbook example of that, where uh, the the hullabaloo starts with uh, sightings of a winged humanoid creature, uh, and there are many sightings of this creature for a 13 month period. There are uh, people reporting uh, paranormal phenomena in their home, poltergeist outbreaks. Um, meetings with men in black, uh, there are shadow figures, uh, there are missing animals, uh, and there are, are also waves of UFO activity. In fact, there was really more UFO activity than there were sightings of Mothman. And all of these things just happened in a big fishbowl for 13 months. Not that they've gone away, um, but uh, the wave came to an end with the collapse of the Silver Bridge in the o Ohio River. 42 people died in that. And it seemed to close the window on the hyperactivity. But Point Pleasant, West Virginia, is still, uh, still very active and uh, continues to have a lot of things going on. So we, we have to look at, at these things holistically. And let's say, for example, that a researcher hears about a UFO wave uh, hitting a certain area. Um, in order to get the big picture, you have to inquire about other things as well. Then the other aspect of this that bears more research are the experiencers themselves. And um, in... Um, many cases there there are people who are uh, you could call them catalysts or trigger people lifelong experiencers um, that they get the the brunt of things that wherever they go if there's phenomena available uh, active or even dormant waiting to be stirred up they're they're going to be at the receiving end of it these people have lifelong histories they often come from families with lifelong histories and yet we don't really spend enough time researching those histories and uh, how these individuals uh, m might have something in their consciousness that is capable of stirring up um, whatever it is that's out there in, in the unseen realms in order to make things manifest. Uh, so these are two areas that um, researchers are paying more attention to in terms of, of understanding uh, why things happen. Mm -hmm. And um, we also have to look at the energy of the land. Uh, I'm happy to see more attention devoted to that. I've been talking about that for over 30 years, that there is an energy to the landscape that sometimes propels this activity into manifestation. And um, I think that's why we have certain corridors and hot spots, uh, because there's something literally in the land, in the soil, in the configuration of the earth that energizes the manifestation of stuff that's present around us all the time, but usually invisible and unnoticed. There's, uh, 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 onto another topic or area of, of activity, something that I know, uh, or a, a location I know that you were involved with, uh, going way back now, hard to believe, almost uh, 19 years ago, the uh, the Angela Webb House uh, in New Jersey. Um, that, to me, been a very compelling uh, case. I know you've spoken about it in the past. Could you could you touch on that for a little bit and tell us a little bit about the background of that case and, and what, what you discovered when you were looking into that? Well, that case was investigated in depth by two friends of mine who are psychic mediums, Carl Petrie and Paula Roberts. And uh, Carl Petri, uh, who at the time was an independent filmmaker, uh, did, a, did a film on the topic. Uh, I had the benefit of visiting the Angela Webb property um, from the outside, but I never uh, saw the inside of the house because by the time um, I entered uh, that phase of the, the investigation, the woman uh, that Carl identified as Angela Webb had perished in 9-11 and the house had passed on to other ownership. But 
uh, it's located in what would be called a hot zone in New Jersey. Uh, long history of UFO activity. Um, there are certain places that you could say are cursed land uh, that for whatever reason, whether it's the energy of the landscape, something doesn't agree with people, um, bad things seem to happen all the time over, over the course of history. And um, I have done some research into uh, what I would call cursed land areas. And these would be areas where people move in and their lives just basically start falling apart. Uh, they might start quarreling. They have health issues. If there are any uh, addiction issues, they come forward. There are financial crises. Uh, there might be murders, suicides, horrible accidents. Uh, and when you, if you have the capability of looking historically at the general area, you might find um, corroborating evidence to that regard. I mean, it's it's not conclusive proof that anything is cursed by any means, but it's odd coincidence, and, and uh, these kinds of pockets do exist. Well, this house exists in one of those pockets, and uh, there had been some bad road accidents uh, where people had been killed. There um, had been um, a suicide on the property. There had been um, abuse on the property in the past. Uh, and the house was populated with a lot of ghosts. And in fact, uh, the woman identified as Angela Webb when she bought it. She bought it as a second property. She had a high paying financial job at the World Trade Center. And uh, the house in New Jersey was uh, a place for her to get away. And after I, I I believe that, and now I never met Angela Webb, uh, but from all descriptions and from Carl's research, she most likely was a trigger person. That is, she wherever she went, she probably stirred up whatever was there. And she came to realize that her house was very haunted with a lot of ghosts. And she had the impression that this was a soul-eating house. That is, uh, if you had the misfortune to die, in the house or while you owned the house, you became trapped in the house and that a lot of the ghosts there uh, were from the, the house's long history. Um, at first she was uh, very upset at the activity in the house and she tried to assert her dominion over the ghosts. This is my house, this is not your house. Uh, and it seems like she sort of made a peace with them, uh, or at least came to accept them, uh, that they weren't going to go away. Um, there was um, one occasion where she hosted a weekend party for a lot of her friends and co-workers, and some of them had such terrifying experiences in the house that they even departed in the middle of the night and refused to go back. According to Carl, after Angela perished in the 9-11 disaster, um, the, um, the authorities wanted some DNA evidence in case you know anything uh, could be found from the debris. And even her parents wouldn't go back into the house to collect anything from a hairbrush or anything like that. They didn't like being in the house. I do not know how many owners have had the house since then, um, and uh, the people who moved in after that were not um, hospitable to the idea of paranormal investigation, and so neither Carl nor I have pursued anything uh, in quite some time there. That wraps up part one of our interview with Rosemary Ellen Guiley in part two, Strange Accidents, Suicide, Violence, Abuse, and many other strange occurrences allegedly took place on and around the Angela Webb property in New Jersey. Was it all caused by the paranormal and why? Also, does the legend that if you die when in possession of the house, you will haunt the house ring true? Also, what were some of the terrifying events that drove people from that very property? How does an object become haunted? Are there any objects that tend to be more haunted than others? How should one appropriately dispose of a haunted object that plagues their life? 
And what is the strange Zozo connection that she's written about that many experience after playing with a spirit board? Those questions and more will be answered in part two of our interview with Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Until next time, for the Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.